Uh, hello everyone, welcome to our series of webinars about serverless and today we are going to talk about building and transforming your applications into serverless uh, on AWS. So let's start. Today we have uh, Mateus, he is from AWS, uh, Senior Partner Solution Architect and me, Sergey. I'm from Antetix, working as project manager here. Uh, probably all of you know a lot about AWS, uh, so a few words about Antetix uh, for those of you who attended our webinars first time. Uh, so Antetix is a cloud native consultancy that focuses on providing solutions to businesses, enabling them to exploit the potential of the cloud and its native feature. Antetix integrates a complex solution with the cloud for different kinds of businesses for more than 10 years. And uh, now let's move on to our topic. And uh, now Mateus will tell us how to build and transform application into serverless. So Mateus, please. Thank you so much, very much, Sergey, and I appreciate it uh, once again to be here. You know, in this webinar, uh, this series of webinar, we're talking about serverless. Hey, hello to everyone. So my name is Mateus Ahais. I am a partner solution architect here on AWS. Uh, I've been here for almost three years and working partners like in TEDx. So uh, today our topic presentation is about building and transforming applications into serverless on AWS. Uh, but before we started, I, I'd like to do a, a recap. So on, a, on our previous you know, uh, webinar, we discussed about what is serverless, right? So uh, this technology, serverless, I, I'm meaning about serverless, uh, eliminates the infrastructure management uh, tasks like capacity provision, you know, patching, and you can so focus, just focus in, in, in writing your code uh, for, this, for the servers and, and to the business applications to your customers. So servers applications start, for instance, with Lambda and could, you know, move on to event-driven architecture, naval integrated with mo more than 200 AWS servers and also with SaaS solutions. So today in our, you know, modern application modernization, you know, serverless stacks, we have a bunch of variety of servers, uh, you know, starting with, you know, computing, uh, for instance, AWS Lambda, like I mentioned, you know, AWS Fargate, which is our compute engine for ECS and AKS. Uh, we have, you know, Amazon API Gateway. We're going to talk briefly about API Gateway, you know, uh, afterwards, uh, which is a fully managed servers. Uh, we have, for instance, in, in, into data store layer, we have uh, Amazon DynamoDB, which is which our NoSQL database serverless, of course. We have dev developer tools like CloudFormation, which is our infrastructure as a code. We have, you know, security, right? Because security is very important. It's top priority for AWS. Uh, we have also, you know, native, you know, AWS servers, uh, totally, you know, servers. You don't need to manage any, every, uh, you know, uh, everything. You just need to focus, which exactly is the purpose of that specific AWS service. Okay, so you, this is the recap. Let's let's move on to what is the topic for our today, you know, presentation. So uh, let's talk about, you know, uh, how how is how is look like, you know, a three tier application architecture. So this is very basic, right? So uh, starting with uh, when when you when you have a traditional three tier web application, you have a presentation layer, which is the web server. You have application layer, which is you have the business logic there, and you have the database. So this is a traditional three tier, right? So is a this architecture is very functional, but but as we know. It doesn't enable you to move fast uh, as you probably want to do, right? And also, you can only deploy at the pace of a, a slowest component within the monolithic way. So, we are we we are seeing you know a a, a paradigm a paradigm paradigm shift, uh, which is coming from the monolithic applications towards to the micro server. So what is a monolithic application? So monolithic applications is a tireless couple 
single tier application in which that user interface and the data are combined into a single program from a single platform. So it's self-contained and in independent from other computing you know, applications. So what is a microservice then? So microservice, you have, you know, loose copally, it's independently, it's scalable, you know, the application service. So release use velocity, right? That's the primary goal. And also you can just modify a particular piece of your application uh, and don't necessarily need to have a downtime. So, one of the major top of our presentation today is talking about how to modernize uh, your application to serverless, right? Starting with, you know, monolithics, then microservice, and then ultimately, you know, serverless. So we have five pillars of modern application. We have application patterns, operation model, so build, uh, builders experience, management governance, and data management. Uh, Today we're going to focus, you know, in architecture patterns, it's starting with, you know, the general purpose of thinking serverless, right? So one of the first thing that you need to 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 think about it in your application about serverless is to think in the future first, right? So avoiding. Uh, all monolithic thinking and just focus on the, the right purpose for the right futures that you want to try to build. Then moving on to another key element is stateless. It's, it's almost impossible in a kind of way to mi do microservice in a stateful application, right? You need to communication to each other. So the key for scaling is to have your application stateless and focus on event as well. So one of the one of the architectures, modern architectures that we have over here, it's uh, event driven architecture, which is basically events are triggered to any actions, and then you can trigger any other actions from that specifically event. Uh, also, you need to use the purpose build. Uh, AWS service for that specific purpose, right? So I'm I'm gonna use Amazon DynamoDB because I know my data and I know that it, it's gonna good, gonna be a good fit for that particular schema or that particular pattern of, of my data because I know my data. Um, and moving on to data flow, uh, you need to make you know data decisions early on. So having data uh, in terms of how I'm gonna build my serverless application is very key, and also to streamline all data flow you know across my application as well. So this uh, is is gonna look like a more than three tier application. So uh, this is a modern architecture. So it does seems look more like the, the other architecture that I just present to you guys. So there is a lot of same elements here. So that is a presentation layer, the business logic, and also the data. But there are also some key differences over here. So first key difference, it's this is, a, this is not a whole application architecture. This is a single microservice application. Uh, this service uh, performs a specific business functions and many of our, our, our customers today run dozens, hundreds, even thousands uh, of this kind of service to improve scalability and resilience. This is a big topic, uh, you know, today because, you know, we need to think uh, our application to a single purpose. Then a second key difference is integration and communication. So we are using here a combination of events, uh, message and queues that can you can enable communication, you know, uh, within the microservice and the APIs in order to communicate between those servers as well. So and the third, uh, the third difference is to have a purpose build data strategy. So rather than have 
a single database. Uh, like, like I mean, here I'm illustrating three databases. Why? Because I need to, you know, choose the data store that best fit to my business and to my business needs. And finally, uh, as you can see, as you cannot see over here, actually, the most important is the things that is working under the hood. So I'm, I'm running these, you know, in functions or even in containers. So doing a zoom out uh, of this uh, application, architecture uh this is is you know, a more than three tier application is going to look like in terms of microservice way so there is a lot of like i mentioned a lot of similarities uh with the, the traditional two tier but now i can see more broadly i have single single purpose you know servers they are communicating to each other uh via you know apis for instance. So this is a way to distribute my, my systems and I can do this, you know, via microservers and, you know, especially with serverless as well. In order to do that, you know, as you can see over here, there is a lot of APIs communication uh, doing as a communication between in the servers. So APIs are the front door of microservers. So APIs are the, are, are the one of the primary mechanisms through which are these small pieces, small servers communicate to each other. So uh, they are, you know, front door, like I mentioned. So, for instance, here in AWS, in Amazon, every time that, you know, someone needs to build an API, uh, you know, first of all, they, they need to check out if that API was not created before because, because you're going to avoid overlapping. So you, you should start to think, you know, in, in this kind of way to, in order to avoid, you know, overlapping for APIs and build a more solid way in terms of communication. So how can I do that? Uh, I can use on AWS, uh, you can use Amazon API Gateway. So this is a simple microservice. It's only, you know, a REST API, you know, responding at 200, you know, uh, state of code, uh, whatever, you know, this resource is, you know, is doing a get. So I'm using a Amazon API Gateway to be my door, my front, my front door, and then I, I'm gonna trigger, you know, a lambda, and this lambda gonna retrieve the data that I need to get that, uh, you know, request response. So very simple, very straightforward. But you can use these, you know, for a single purpose. So that lambda over there, you know, is for a single purpose to just, uh, put, you know, get the, the information that the API gateway is requiring to. Uh, moving to a different way. So this is a API uh, responded by a REST, but uh, that is another way that you can manage API as well. You can use AWS App Sync. So AWS App Sync is a GraphQL APIs way to manage, you know, your APIs. And you know, GraphQL is agnostic to data source technology, allowing you to easily uh, abstract them from any in many different applications, it's very powerful. So AWS API, uh, AWS App Sync is a single interface to connect and aggregate these multiple uh, servers and application. And actually App Sync can act as a data layer and an interface to connect and communicate the seamless, uh, you know, across multiple microservices. Even if they are running in different AWS accounts, you can use the power of AWS App Sync in order to grab that information and, you know, just manage your APIs using GraphQL. That is another way to do it. Uh, moving on to another approach, using serverless uh, application. All the servers that I'm talking today, is, uh, they, are, they are serverless. Another way to, uh, and another pattern that we have in serverless architecture is by doing streaming and messaging. So, uh, so if, if you ask me, what is the message in the context of a serverless, serverless application, we can start 
we can start, you know, uh, talking about event-driven architecture communication across the service using message. So message are basically you now JSON object, right? So you can, you know, grab and, and, and there, there is a lot of details about them specifically the event. So as you can see in this architecture, I can capture that using SQS uh, and, you know, consume that using the power of Lambda in order to, you know, uh, register that information in Amazon DB, for instance, or I can use the the, the Kinesis family in order to streamline my my all my data coming from my API gateway, and you know and change and transform and convert my data to, for instance, a Pash Parquet, uh, in you know in between that stream, and then you know just register on Amazon RTS for it. So as you can see, you know. So there is a many service that it can, you know, really empowers you uh, the possibilities using AWS serverless servers. So these servers provide you queues, machine final capabilities, event bursts, content future, and any more, you know, and, and any others, you know, powerful features using, you know, these specific servers. Uh, talking about event driven specifically. Event, events it, it are the connective tissue of modern applications. So this is an, um, a very common pattern that we have over here because event-driven architecture can improve you scalability, fault tolerance, and agility by reducing de dependencies between process and the teams. So events, what is it? events? Events are asynchronous events, right? They are asynchronous. So you don't need to wait a response to move to, an, uh, to the next steps. This is improve your scalability and res resilience as well. And most of all, you know, the dependencies. So you can use, uh, you know, message events and trigger in order to communicate between those decoupled servers uh, which is a very common pattern, and those events contain, you know, information about what is changing in the system state, such as, for instance, a new order or, or a new or a complete payments, and you're gonna focus. These events are gonna focus, avoiding to, you know, tiling coupling. Uh, actually, they are gonna decouple, you know, your entire application. Then can promote this, you know, as a great flexibility and extensibility for your application, which turns out help you to improve the velocity and agility for your developers teams, right? Because you can you just focus on the specifically uh, events and to treat that specifically events and how that's gonna be scale. Uh, talking about decoupling a little bit. So decoupling states for servers improve resilience and, and handle errors case better. So uh, if, if you are running your business logic in container, for instance, you can use AWS Fargate, which is our serverless engine for, you know, containers. Um, or you can use even, you know, AWS Lambda. Uh, when you are, you know, storing, you know, state, you can use step functions as well. So in the next architecture, uh, basically is showing how can I, you know, use and how can I orchestrate uh, complex distributed workflows if I need to choose and I have, you know, a decision tree, how can I work orchestrate that? So you can use AWS tab functions, which is a low code visual workflow servers that developers use to build distribute application, automate an IT and business process and build data and machine learning pipeline using AWS servers. You can, these workflows manage failures, retrievers, parallelizations, service integration, and overall observability for your developers can focus just in the higher value business logic. So as you can see, you know, during this, this presentation, there is a lot of patterns that you can use, you know, uh, serverless, uh, 
AWS serverless servers uh, into this many application modern uh, architecture. How can I do it, Matthias? How can I you know, start to implement this? So first of all, let me tell you a story. So there is a pattern uh, that we have uh, called the stringer pattern. Uh, this is this is really an Amazon.com story. This is also no, you know, strength pattern. Martin Folio uh, coined a term Instagram pattern after he went to on a vacation in Southeast Asia and noticed that as strangled vines that grows on trees. After years, this vine take over the tree, and the biomass is more vines than the trees. So this is a metaphor that you can ship, you know, away your monolith applications and focus by setting APIs and breaking up your application into the trees, the monolithic, in, uh, until it's gone. So as you can see, you can change this pivoting you know, by creating APIs on the edge of that monolithic uh, until that it's gonna be away. So you can use that, you know, by creating and starting by just creating APIs and by the end of, you know, some uh, journey, you're gonna have, you know, entire application using serverless, for instance. So, but how can I, you know, doing? You, you need to, you need to pay attention. That is a journey, like I mentioned. So, one of the first steps is, you know, is to move into a program, program shift for business velocity with AWS service. Is to just move. Right. Let's move on to an EC2, for instance, and then we are going to grow because we're going to start to see all the benefits that, you know, AWS cloud can provide to us. Then you're going to shift it to containers, like I mentioned, uh, by, you know, suffocating all the model application by creating APIs on the ads using the strength pattern. And you're going to start to doing containers and moving on to ultimately the serverless, which is, you know, the, 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 the ultimately proposition for all the modern applications. So in conclusion, every decision that you make will impact, you know, your time uh, span and how your team is going to operate. So this is apply, this is apply, apply across the board, in, in you know in, in every aspect in an application. So modern applications uh, are categorized, like I mentioned, in those five vectors. So that is a modular, you know, servers, you know, automate uh, automate uh, service delivery, and so on. So focus your application applications in creating applications in a way that it can enable to achieve agility uh, that is the the way that you're gonna innovate on behalf for you and on behalf for your customers and you can have uh, all the knowledge that uh, within Tedx in order to help uh, in that journey right because I like I mentioned this is a journey so, uh, with that, I would like to pass uh, the mic for uh, Sergey. They're going to take a little bit deep about all these AWS servers and all the patterns as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mateus. Uh, so now, as we know how to build serverless application, uh, let's talk how we can uh, basically deploy our serverless applications into AWS. Uh, so what we need to do is, uh, first of all, infrastructure, because uh, we need uh, a place where we can deploy our uh, code, our resources. Uh, when we're building uh, serverless applications, usually we use AWS managed services, uh, for example, AWS Lambda, DynamoDB, Big Gateway, etc. Uh, so we should know how to create such resources in AWS Cloud. Uh, so, usually when uh, developers start uh, playing with serverless, they start from AWS console. Uh, they create the resources there manually and configure them. It's a good approach to start learning serverless, but uh, it's not a good option if you plan to build some complex solution inside AWS. Uh, 
Uh, why? Because uh, uh, such uh, serverless application usually include lots of uh, services, components, and configuration, and these become uh, too complex to keep all of these things in mind. Uh, and you simply can uh, forget what and how uh, we configure it in AWS cons. So infrastructure as a code uh, can help us visit uh, how it can help. Let's review, first of all, how it works. So uh, developers write templates. In templates, uh, they describe resources and configuration for them. And these templates store it in a uh, version control system. Uh, so uh, different team members uh, has access to it. And for example, they can see history of this template. After that, a DevOps or developer, on our previous webinar, we discussed that uh, uh, when uh, you work with serverless, probably your developers uh, should have uh, uh, enough knowledge of AWS to work with infrastructure during their development tasks. Uh, so DevOps or developers apply this template uh, to AWS using infrastructure as a code tool. Uh, it sounds uh, very simple from the first look and also it gives us a uh, few benefits. So when we use infrastructure as a code, we have an uh, automated provision process. It means that we don't need to do any manual change in the cloud. Uh, all happening automatically and much faster than uh, we will do it manually. Also, it helps us to avoid any human errors in this process. Uh, reusability. So templates uh, are usable. You can use the uh, same template, but with different parameters uh, to create, for example, uh, multiple environments. Versioning. Uh, templates, it's a code. So we can store it in version control system and we can apply our uh, regular development processes for it. Uh, for example, we can uh, do a peer review for templates. Uh, let's review what options we have uh, for AWS. So there are five uh, most popular frameworks. Uh, AWS CloudFormation, AWS SAM, Terraform, AWS Cloud Development Kit, and Serverless Framework. Let's review each of them in more details. So CloudFormation, it's AWS native service uh, to uh, define and configure resources in AWS Cloud. How it works? Uh, so basically developer write template using YAML or JSON format. This template upload to S3. Uh, CloudFormation reads this template from S3 and makes appropriate API calls on our behalf uh, to create resources for us. And at the end, we have a CloudFormation stack, its set of resources uh, that were built. Uh, AWS has a page with CloudFormation template snippets for various use cases. Uh, so here you can find useful uh, snippets for your project and probably it uh, will be helpful for you to start with CloudFormation. Uh, here is an example of a CloudFormation template. In this example, we describe uh, AWS Lambda with security group and uh, IAM role for it. Next tool is AWS CDK or Cloud Development Kit. So it's uh, an open source software development framework to define our uh, cloud application resources using uh, familiar programming, programming languages. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, AWS CDK allows us to describe infrastructure by code, by coding it. Uh, CDK is a language agnostic tool, so we can uh, choose our favorite language from the supported list. Also, CDK has a number of uh, high level components. It's uh, pre-configured uh, resources with proven defaults, so we can build serverless applications without being an expert using it. CDK also supports if statements and while loops. It may be useful for you, for example, if you plan to create multiple resources but with uh, some difference in, in them. Uh, CDK also uh, transform uh, the code uh, to cloud formation, uh, so basically you can think that CDK is kind of extension for cloud formation. Uh, at the same time, uh, to work with CDK, it requires uh, for people who work with it to have some uh, coding skills, because basically you need to write a code, so you should know how to write the code. And uh, CDK, it's a free tool, similar to cloud formation and other tools uh, that we will review today. So you don't uh, pay for this tool, but you pay for resources that you created in the cloud. And here is example of CDK. Uh, 
Uh, in this example, we built a REST API uh, using API Gateway and Lambda services. It was um, a serverless application model. It's a, a framework to build uh, serverless applications in AWS. It has uh, two parts, SAM templates and SAM CLI. SAM templates uh, it allow us to uh, describe functions, APIs, databases, and even source mappings using very short syntax. SAM templates also transform to uh, cloud formation templates. Uh, SAM CLI, it's a tool that uh, allows us to build uh, uh, and uh, deploy our serverless applications, and also it allows us to do local testing and debugging for our serverless applications. So it's a very powerful tool when we are uh, building uh, serverless applications in AWS. Uh, here is an example of uh, SAM uh, template. In this example, we describe uh, API Gateway with Lambda and with uh, DynamoDB. So as you can see, in a very few lines of code, we described all nice resources to build REST API. So such short syntax uh, makes this tool to be very powerful to describe infrastructure. Uh, next tool is Terraform. It's a tool for building, changing, and versioning uh, our infrastructure. It's a cross-platform uh, platform tool, so you may use uh, any public or po any popular uh, service providers or built in house solutions as well. Uh, it also has uh, high-level and low-level components. So how can uh, we work with Terraform? Uh, we define a configuration file where we describe our resources and configuration for them. After that, we describe variable files. Uh, file. uh, in this file, we uh, put uh, values for variables uh, from our configuration file. After that, we use Terraform to build a plan. So basically, Terraform uh, uh, check uh, all your changes, uh, build dependency graph, and show you what change will be applied uh, in the cloud. So you make uh, you may make decision do you want to apply this change or not. Uh, Terraform use a cloud provider. In our case, it's AWS, and through cloud provider, it makes call to AWS cloud to create resources for us. Uh, final state, final resources were created. Uh, Terraform save it in a uh, state file, uh, so we can store it on our local machine, or we can use um, Terraform Cloud to store this uh, state file in the cloud. So in this case, uh, multiple team members can work with infrastructure. And here is example of Terraform. In this example, we describe uh, Lambda with IAM role. And the last uh, framework for today, it's a serverless framework. Uh, it's for, uh, it helps us to develop, deploy, troubleshoot, and secure our serverless applications with radically less overhead and cost. It also has two parts, open source CLI and hosted dashboard where we can see resource created. Uh, together, they provide us with full serverless uh, application life cycle management. How serverless work? Uh, so basically, you write serverless YAML file and serverless framework transform it to cloud formation. So from the one hand, you can uh, use all features from serverless framework, and from another, uh, you can uh, use all benefits uh, from the cloud formation. So serverless framework it's a powerful tool to describe serverless applications. And uh, here is example of serverless framework. Here we also describe. Uh, REST API uh, by describing uh, API Gateway, Lambda, and DynamoDB services. It's uh, not that short uh, template as uh, SAM, but still very short syntax to describe resources. Uh, so what to choose? Uh, from the first look, all of these tools look uh, very similar. So what shall we use and in what cases? So first characteristics that we will compare these uh, tools with purpose. So cloud formation is AWS service to build infrastructure for AWS. So if you plan to build a uh, complex solution in, in AWS, uh, you should use cloud formation. Terraform is a cross-platform tool. Uh, so for example, if you plan to build multi-cloud solution, or for example, you create infrastructure in AWS, but has plans to migrate your infrastructure to some other cloud, which may 
never happen in real life. So for such cases, Terraform is a good option for you. Serverless framework, it's framework to describe lambdas and uh, related resources. So if you are building serverless applications, it uh, best options for you. Uh, but at the same time, if you plan to build something else in the cloud, serverless framework, uh, using a serverless framework, it may be uh, difficult to do this. For example, if you plan to build a data warehouse based on Redshift in AWS. Uh, second important uh, characteristic is uh, change management. Uh, why it's important? Because usually we want to automate our all our processes, including uh, infrastructure provisioning. Uh, so we should uh, understand how uh, these tools manage change and actually do apply for infrastructure. So Terraform offers us an operation which show a uh, difference that will be applied in the cloud. And uh, you can review this change manually and make decision. Do you want to apply it or not? Uh, cloud formation and serverless framework. Serverless framework, as you may remember, uh, transform serverless YAML to cloud formation template. Uh, so uh, both of them uh, support verify template operation, apply uh, template, and also they both can do uh, rollback in case of any issues during apply. So uh, these uh, two uh, tools are a good option if you want to embed infrastructure provision process inside your CICD practice. Uh, in this comparison, uh, we didn't include SAM and CLI because they are from AWS and for AWS, uh, and they are kind of extensions for cloud formation. But shortly, SAM is for serverless applications uh, in AWS, and CTK it's, uh, uh, has uh, some additional feature in comparison with cloud formation, but at the same time, it required to have uh, coding skills in your team to uh, write CTK and describe resources using it. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, now, as we know how we can simplify resource provision process in AWS, uh, let's discuss how actually we can uh, deploy our applications. Uh, as we discussed uh, today a couple of times, so when we're building serverless applications, they usually include lots of uh, component services and configurations. So it's mandatory to have uh, automatic, automatic, automatic deploy process. Uh, so uh, from the very beginning, let's uh, review what AWS offer for us for these purposes. Uh, as you probably know, AWS has services for everything. So for uh, deploy, it offers us uh, code start, code build, code deploy, code pipeline, code commit, code artifact services. Uh, we also include here Cloud Shell and Cloud9 services. Uh, they may be useful for you to start learning in AWS and also uh, they may be very useful for you for development purposes. Today, we will speak more about code build and code pipeline services. So code build, it's AWS uh, fully managed service uh, for continuous integration. It allow uh, you to build your source code uh, to run tests and build final artifact for first deployment. And AWS code pipeline, it also AWS fully managed service, but for continuous uh, delivery, it uh, uh, allow you to build, easily build release pipelines to update infrastructure and applications. Uh, so uh, let's say we want to build release pipeline, how it will look like. So uh, we take code pipeline series and uh, let's see what uh, basic uh, code pipeline, how it will look like. So first step is source. We need to specify where our source code stored. It's required uh, stage. We can't skip it. So code pipeline know where uh, our source code stored and can uh, monitor it and trigger a pipeline on uh, any changes there. Uh, second step is build application. So we want to build our application. We want to run a test on it. Probably do some uh, run some uh, static code analysis tools on it. And at the end, we want to build final artifact for further deployment. Next step is we start deploying our applications. Usually we have uh, multiple environments and it depends on uh, project, product, uh, teams, and etc. But at very simple case, we have three environments. Dev for development purposes, pilot for uh, testing and for demo purposes, and production for real users. So we deploy our 
application from low environment till production. Uh, doing uh, deploy in this way allows us to detect issues with our application on uh, early stage and in safe uh, environment. So now let's do a deep dive to our code pipeline uh, and uh, review how actually it works. So source stage uh, code pipeline has uh, integration with various sources. It could be something from AWS like code commit, ECR, or even S3 service. Or you can use uh, code star uh, source uh, connection to integrate code pipeline with GitHub or Bitbucket, for example. So there is uh, uh, a lot of sources that we can use for code pipeline from popular GitHub to, uh, let's say, uh, it was code commit if you want to store uh, code in AWS. Uh, for uh, to build our application to run a test, we use code build service here, uh, but for cases, uh, for example, when you have very complex build process with lots of dependencies and maybe you already have configured on Jenkins or somewhere else, and you don't want to uh, migrate it uh, to code build at this stage, uh, so code pipeline for such cases has integration with various uh, CI tools like Jenkins, TeamCity, CloudBees and others. So you can integrate code pipeline to execute uh, Jenkins job uh, for you. But we recommend to use code build because it's uh, AWS fully managed service. Uh, you don't need to configure, you don't need to maintain it. And uh, basically you pay only for build time that you use. After we run test on our code, we want to build final uh, artifact. In our case, uh, we use uh, CloudFormation to describe our infrastructure, so we build, uh, so we uh, verify and package CloudFormation template here. After that, we style, start deployment uh, process. First of all, we want to update infrastructure and uh, code uh, for our lambdas. To do this, we can just uh, run CloudFormation. Code pipeline has native integration with code build series and uh, cloud formation. So for cloud formation, we can use cloud formation provider and uh, cloud formation will do all the magic. It will uh, update infrastructure and it will update source code for our lambdas. Uh, next step here is apply database. Uh, so let's imagine that we have REST API that work with our serverless relational database. And after we deploy our application, we want to uh, run some scripts on database, make some change there. Uh, to do this, uh, we recommend to use uh, database migration tools. Uh, so uh, we can use code build here to run such database migration tool to apply this change. And the last step here, after we uh, did some preparation work, uh, apply infrastructure, update uh, code, and uh, do some post-release activities, is that we want to make sure that our application uh, works as expected. To do this, we need to run automation tests. Uh, here we can, uh, in, in this example, use code build for this, but uh, you also can integrate code pipeline to run, for example, them from TeamCity, if you have configured them, them there. Uh, deployment for different environments looks very similar, so there is only one di difference in uh, automation test uh, suits. Uh, a part of uh, code pipeline here, we need to have a three packet to store uh, cloud formation package, and we need KMS key because we want to uh, encrypt our package and store them in a secure way. Uh, and to summarize, our pipeline has uh, four main blocks. First, it's lint and tests. Second is to package cloud formation. Uh, third is apply database. In our example, it, it's just example of custom action. You can do whatever may be required for your deployment here. And uh, the last step is to run uh, automation. It's a uh, uh, required step if you want to do, to build continuous uh, delivery process. Uh, now, uh, let's uh, talk about uh, data in serverless applications. When we build a classic application, we usually have some servers or virtual machines with hard drives. We save data or files there, and we can, let's say, SSH uh, to them and see these files. But when we work with serverless, we don't have uh, such servers. We can't SSH and 
use the data that we may save there. So let's uh, take a look what options we have to store data when we're building serverless applications. First service that I want to mention, it's Amazon S3 service. It's the most popular service from AWS and probably, probably uh, all of you know about it. Uh, we can use it for serverless applications. And uh, it has a long list of uh, useful features. Uh, for example, you may use S3 Select uh, for cases when you have a very large uh, text file and you don't want to read it as uh, a uh, whole. You want to read it by part by part, so you can use it. Or for example, you can use S3 Lifecycle Policy DC if you want to, for example, delete files after 30 days after creation. Uh, or, for example, S3 Replication allows us to automatically replicate data to another region. So, uh, basically, how we can use uh, S3 uh, for our serverless application? Uh, it's very simple. We uh, use Amazon AWS SDK from our lambdas to work with uh, S3. Uh, let's say our lambda is Python lambda, so we use bot 3 to work with uh, Amazon S3. Another more interesting case, it's S3 object lambda. Uh, so let's imagine a case that you store some data on S3 and you have multiple applications that work with this data. Uh, for example, you have e-commerce applications that work with personal information and you have some analytics applications that don't need personal information from this data set, but it requires some additional information. So you can use S3 object lambda to run some code when someone requests the data from S3 before uh, returning this results. So uh, this code executed in Lambda and here you can do whatever may be required. For example, you can remove some fields uh, from the result or, uh, for example, you can uh, get some additional data from the DynamoDB and merge it with the data from S3. So it's a very powerful tool when you have uh, multiple views on the same data set. And the second interesting case is S3 email notifications. Uh, so basically, it allows us to subscribe Lambda to uh, events uh, on S3 when it may be useful. For example, you have a platform, one part of your platform writes some raw data to S3 and you want to pre-process or process them using Lambda. So you can uh, use S3 notifications to subscribe Lambda to such events and Lambda will be invoked each time file will be created, updated or deleted on S3. So your Lambda will receive uh, meta information about this event and about this file, and you can do some logic. It's really notifications has integration with SNS and SQS, uh, so you can uh, build a synchronous processing for your data on S3 using this uh, feature. Uh, now let's discuss about uh, data sto uh, storage options for Lambdas. So uh, Lambda has temporal storage. It's in TMP folder. Uh, uh, it's ephemeral storage that is not intended for durable storage. Uh, so it means that, for example, if you will save file in your Lambda during another invocation, you may not see this file. EFS, it's uh, AWS fully managed service, uh, elastic share, uh, shared file system designed to be used by other AWS services, for example, by Lambda. So you can use EFS to share a file uh, between different Lambda invocations. Also, you can uh, mount EFS to EC2 instance, so your classic application will have access to the same data. Uh, Lambda and ephemeral storage, it, uh, it's new launch from AWS. So previously, uh, Lambda had only ephemeral storage for 512 megabytes, and now you can configure the setting for Lambda. Uh, you can set up, uh, configure ephemeral storage size from 512 megabytes uh, up to 10 uh, gigabytes. If compare data uh, options, uh, so uh, ephemeral storage is the fastest option, but not durable. EFS is uh, faster than S3, but it's just a shared file system when S3 has uh, lots of uh, features that may be useful for your cases. And Lambda layers, it uh, zip archives, uh, where you can uh, put uh, common dependencies and libraries from your Lambda, so it helps you to reduce uh, Lambda package size and reduce uh, deployment, Lambda deployment time. And at the end, we want to compare the name ADP and our serverless. So basically, when you build a serverless application, you uh, write your code and execute it in 
in the lambda. Uh, so you can use from the lambda you can use uh, any service from AWS, uh, but here you want to reuse uh, these uh, two services. Uh, Amazon Aurora Serverless. So it's uh, AWS fully managed service relational database. It's Mongo, uh, sorry, it's MySQL and Postgres uh, SQL uh, compatible database. Uh, you may think why in general we need a serverless relational database. Uh, so uh, first thing that serverless usually means that it's a fully managed service and you don't need to do any maintenance work with it. Second is when you work with a relational database, uh, scales, high database, it's very complex task because, uh, uh, for example, you have two options to do, uh, for example, horizontal scaling by adding additional instances to database cluster and use these instances as a read replicas it will scale read operation but uh, will not help for write operations otherwise you can do uh, vertical scaling and for example use instances with uh, high cpu and memory settings uh, but um, such uh, scale operation will cause uh, outages on your and downtimes on your application so Aurora Serverless, uh, it's a service that can automatically scale uh, based on the load on your application. Uh, it happens without any downtimes and uh, pretty fast. Also want to mention that Aurora Serverless version 2 has uh, now support multi-AZ configuration and replicas. Uh, DynamoDB series, uh, so it's AWS fully managed series, uh, which uh, support uh, document and uh, uh, key value data models. Uh, it also scalable service designed to work with petabytes of data and guarantee millisecond response time for your queries. It support uh, multi master and multi region uh, distribution. Uh, it has uh, DAGs, it's a kind of in memory cache for DynamoDB. It allows you to say, uh, store your data in a secure way by encrypting them uh, at rest. Uh, it has a very interesting feature uh, DynamoDB uh, streams. Uh, it's a stream of events uh, that happen in DynamoDB when you change something there, and you can subscribe to uh, these events and uh, do some uh, logic there. Uh, so if compare these two services, so the main difference is that DynamoDB is no, no relational database, when Oro Serverless it's a relational database. I don't also want to mention that uh, DynamoDB is, is a good choice when you have petabytes of uh, unstructured data. And I think uh, that's all uh, that we want to cover today. Uh, serverless, again, it's a very big topic, so we split it all the material in a series of webinars. On our next webinars, we will cover how to monitor serverless applications, how to make them to be production ready, and also we will cover uh, security uh, topic. Uh, so we collect worldwide expertise about cloud, so you can uh, follow us and uh, check for our white papers, our case studies, and review, uh, clients review on us. Uh, and uh, we welcome you to come us, uh, and we are ready to uh, book a demo for you and uh, to develop offer based on your uh, business needs. So contact us for a demo. And uh, thank you, and we are happy to answer your questions. Uh, give me one minute to check for questions. So uh, I see one of them very, uh, so one of them uh, we have from our previous uh, webinar. Uh, so Mateus, please help us. Uh, so the question is, in terms of uh, cost running containers on ECS, uh, can you recommend to use EC2 or Fargate? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. You know, we actually have uh, our official AWS blog post that went deep just to you know compare comparing those two options i'm gonna drop here in the chat the link of this this blog post but you know in a nutshell uh 
the 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 difference is basically it depends depends on the use case it depends on the business purpose uh, but uh, what what i can tell you that the advantage of using ec2 uh it's when you are you can maximize the cluster utilizations and rather uh, rather than the benefits to using fargate uh it's when you the cluster utilizations falls under to the certain thresholds so if you know you know the utilizations of your cluster so perhaps you know uh, ec2 could be a better fit right so and fargate it's kind of more you know uh, automatic in the increase in decrease uh, based on demand so usually depends so but there is a lot of other you know things that needs to be considered like for instance operations tasks you know performance as well so usually depends i you know encourage you guys to read about this uh, a little bit more with with details in this blog post to have more accurate and to also fit in the purpose of your needs Thank you, Mateus, for the answer. And I found uh, another interesting and very open question. So the question is, there is a lot of information. So what shall we take home from this webinar? Yeah, yeah, that, that is a very uh, open question, but, you know, it's very important as well. So I think the, the main takeaway here is that serverless only the rest can fit in the various architectures, patterns, and you can migrate your application until they become serverless, right? So the way that you will do it, it depends on each case and the business need, but you can count, for instance, with Intetix expertise in order to help in that journey. So the main takeaway is serverless is, is here, is now, uh, but it's a journey to, you know, uh, turn it on uh, this serverless uh, service on your architecture, but you know you need to have uh, you know knowledge to do that. And Tedx can help with that. You know there is a lot, bunch of AWS materials uh, uh, out there as well that you can use. But uh, you know you know it's a it's a journey, and there is a lot of architectures pattern that you know serverless can fit in. Yeah, totally agree with you, uh, Mateus, and thank you for the answer. Uh, so I think that uh, that's all for today. So uh, we will answer on other questions after the webinar. So uh, thank you, Mateus, and thank you all thank for joining us. And yeah. see you on our next webinars. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.